everyone, and welcome to Fireside Sonoma Speaker Series. Uh, this month, we have a great presenter. We always have great presenters, so I don't know what to tell you. Um, but uh, today, um, just a few things real quick. Um, well, first of all, I want to thank, um, let's see, where am I on the script here? Yeah. Um, we normally live stream this program at three o'clock on actually two o'clock, two o'clock on the third Thursday of every month, except for the month of December. However, we had a problem with our live stream this time, so we're going to upload the video. Uh, so apologies for anybody who tried to watch this on the YouTube channel as a live stream. And then keep in mind that we put up all of our speaker series programs on our YouTube channel. It's a lot of good information there, so go check it out. Uh, they're divided by year, so we have playlists set up. Uh, we actually started this out a long time ago as... Um, what we used to call our fire alliance meetings and then it evolved to what we call our speaker series. Uh, so yeah, go check out the, the last ones that we've done. I think we have like three years worth so far on our channel. I'm Roberta McIntyre, by the way, I'm president and CEO of Fire Safe Sonoma, the countywide Fire Safe Council for Sonoma County. And I'm the host today. And then working behind the scenes, there's a couple other uh, Fire Safe Sonoma folks, you folks that have watched this program regularly know who they are. So helping out today is Emily and Marika from Fire Safe Sonoma. Um, so yeah, thank you, Emily and Marika. And um, we oh, just so if folks don't know by now, Fire Safe Sonoma, we've been the countywide Fire Safe Council for 26 years now. We're in our 26th year of doing the work of wild and fire safety and risk reduction. That's right. We've been working in the space way before wild and fire safety and risk reduction became popular. Before, um, let's see, I already said thank yous to our team. Oh, you guys, don't forget to check out our Fire Safe Sonoma calendar on our website for upcoming events. Uh, we have coming up, I think starting next Tuesday night, uh, I'm not sure if it's posted on our calendar or not. Shame on us if it's not. But there, there is a Resilient Landscape Coalition series coming up. Uh, check out our calendar for the details on that. If you don't see it, you know, today or tomorrow, check back next week. We'll have that information up. But it's a real good series on resilient landscaping. Um, and then uh, to stay in the loop, Remember to subscribe to our updates if you're not already a subscriber and you'll get reminders that, hey, the speaker series is coming up or, hey, we're doing this training coming up, you know, you might be interested in or, hey, there's a grant opportunity, stuff like that. So, um, oh, I know why the script's wrong. I'm on the wrong script. Ha uh ha. -huh. Um, okay, I'm going to wait. I got a paper script. No worries, this happens. Got that. Okay, so last month, if you guys were here, you'll remember we had Stephanie Larson and Sam uh, Morrow from the UC Cooperative Extension on the program to talk about um, grazing uh, and the science behind grazing. And we meant for this to be a two-part presentation. Last month was part one, this is part two. Um, and last month was a really informative presentation. And again, in case you missed it, you can check it out on our YouTube channel. We'll drop that link in the chat. And then next month, we're going to have Shane McLaughlin from Fortress Wildfire on. And Fortress is the next generation fire retardant company focused on reinventing wildfire application technologies that minimize toxicity and environmental impacts while prioritizing safety in efficacy. Um, they have a, a retardant material that is good for the environment and has some longevity after they apply it. And uh, they've, they've used this product in a few grant funded projects already. Fire Safe Summer, we haven't engaged with them yet for any of our projects, but we'll have them on the program next month to, to um, share their product and let you all learn more about that. 
uh, Wildland Fire Safety Tool. So with all that, this month we're pleased to have Emma Schonvicki from Chase and Goats Grazing. Emma will be wrapping up this two-part series on grazing with an outlook on grazing from her organization's perspective and the benefits um, of this cost-effective solution include restoring native plant species, eliminating emissions of traditional land management methods, fire prevention uh, and goats, fire prevention in, in, with goats provide fertilization while they graze. Uh, Emma uh, Sean Vigi is a dedicated Sonoma County native born and raised in the beautiful city of Santa Rosa, California. She's passionate about agricultural animal science and she purchased or, or pursued her undergraduate degree at California State University of Fresno, where she majored in animal science. Continuing her academic journey, she completed a master's in agricultural education at California State University, Chico, in the spring of 2024. In 2015, when these disastrous fires were happening everywhere, Emma and her husband, Chase, established a family-owned and operated goat and sheep grazing business called Chasen, C-H-A-S-I-N, Goat Grazing, LLC. And they specialize in contract grazing. Uh, the business utilizes sheep and goats for effective fire prevention services throughout California. So they're, through their hard work and commitment to sustainable practices, Emma and Chase contribute to environmental stewardship while fostering a love for agriculture in their community. So that's all the talking I'm going to do. I'm going to hand it off to Emma, and uh, she's going to do this awesome presentation. So take it away, Emma. You have the floor. Awesome. Thank you so much. I am going to share my screen really fast, and then we will get started. Everyone see my screen? Yeah. Yes, looks good. Perfect, thank you. Um, so as mentioned, I'm Emma Shonfiki and I am part of Chase and Goat Grazing LLC. Um, I just wanna thank uh, Fire Safe Sonoma for having us on the September Fire Safe Sonoma Speaking Series um, to get started today. I have a little bit of agenda. So first I have our introduction, who we are as a company, um, who I am, and then we'll get into what is targeted grazing, our services specifically, because I can speak the most on what we do, the grazing process from maybe a homeowner's perspective that is looking um, to get into targeted grazing. And then finally, we'll wrap up with any questions that we may have. So about us, um, Previously mentioned, we are a family owned and operated business based in Santa Rosa, California. We um, have been operating since 2015. So we have about nine years of professional experience. We serve Sonoma County residents by providing land management services um, to individuals, businesses, and government agencies. So we've had the privilege of being able to do a little bit of everything and it's really rewarding. We take a lot of pride in being able to work and collaborate with members of our, our community while also reducing fire fuels. Um, so that was a little bit about us. Like mentioned, uh, both my husband and I went to Fresno State University where we managed or majored in animal science with an emphasis in animal and livestock production. Um, I finished my master's in ag education this spring. And then we also welcomed a new baby colt into our lives in March. So we've been pretty busy, um, but we feel very fortunate to be able to work um, in this community that we grew up in as well. So to start, um, what is targeted grazing? Some of you may know what targeted grazing is. It's becoming more and more popular as we see sheep and goats and cattle in some of our state and county parks. Um, but if you're new to targeted grazing, what is it? So targeted grazing is the process of optimizing timing, frequency, intensity, and selectivity of grazing in combinations that purposely manipulate rangeland vegetations to achieve a certain goal. So really... Blankly speaking, timing would be the time of year that we graze. So for some projects, we may want to graze in early spring, some may be summer, some may be fall. It really just depends on the land manager's goal or the property owner's, property owner's goal. And we as contract grazers can help facilitate those goals and make some recommendations based on time of year. 
Frequency would refer to the amount of times um, a particular property is being grazed. So some of our properties are grazed year round, while others may only be grazed once or twice a year. Intensity would refer to stocking density. So depending on the land, we may provide more or less animals depending on what the homeowner or property owner's goals are. So we can achieve those goals. And then finally, we have selectivity. And this one's super important because it helps us choose which animals to use on specific properties. And we'll get into that a little bit later. Um, just the differences between cows versus sheep versus goats and how do we use those tools and those animals um, to provide the best benefits. And then finally, uh, targeted grazers are typically or typically use a portable electric netting to move animals from pen to pen, mimicking that rotational grazing system or that rotational grazing foundation. So we work on that same foundation. The only difference is, is that we use portable infrastructure so we can essentially put it up and take it down in one day, but the same principle still applies. Some benefits of grazing. I know Dr. Uh, Stephanie Larson talked a lot about this in her speaking series, um, but first we have fire fuel mitigation. This is probably the number one benefit, especially in our area of using livestock for vegetation management. Again, our second one is vegetation management, even grazing pressure, reduced herbivore selectivity. We have improved pasture utilization, maintenance of pasture cover, higher perennial grass content. This is really neat to see, especially from a grazing perspective. Uh, livestock have this really unique ability to be able to graze land and um, help native and perennial grasses come back to where they were before. Uh, typically as grazers, we see this takes about three years to restore the land back to its native habitat, but it's really, really neat to see um, some of these invasive species kind of simmer down and have or give the opportunity for our native grasses to grow again. And then we have carbon sequestration. And then finally, we have supports local agriculture. This is so important in our community. We feel very fortunate to be a part of a community that um, loves their local agriculture and supports their agriculture. And this final bullet point just means so much to us, um, giving us the opportunity to do this with our community. So our first one is wildfire prevention. I'll talk a little bit more about this because um, this is our number one goal for homeowners, especially in this area. So as we know, grass and brush can create a sufficient amount of vegetation that contributes to these wildfires that we're seeing. And grazing livestock is a very efficient and effective method at reducing fire fuels when compared to mechanical methods sometimes. And this is because traditional methods may only cut or kill vegetation, leaving fire fuels behind, unless someone were to go back over that and pick them up. And the great unique thing about livestock is that we can clear all the vegetation and leave no residual fuels behind. And we can also replenish that soil with some natural fertilizer at the same time. So it's a two for one um, kind of deal, which is really awesome. And then for us, we specialize in grazing fire breaks as well as larger prevention or fire prevention projects and land management projects. Um, so there's a lot of different benefits to grazing. For us, we like to stick to those uh, fire prevention and those land management projects. That's kind of our key niche, um, but we'll do a variety of different projects. This is a picture that I have that I always love to include. Um, so this is targeted grazing for fire fuel mitigation. On the left, we have that before picture. It's so hard to see in these pictures. Pictures really don't do it justice. But on the left, uh, that dry grass is about four feet tall. And then on the right, we took it down to about an inch. And that was to the client's specifications, what they wanted for their goals. Um, seeing these pictures, seeing it in real time never gets old. I I personally love it. It's just a great measure. Um, it speaks a lot to what the goats and the sheep can do for fire fuel mitigation. So I just had to include that picture. I think it's super neat. Um, next, I'm going to talk a little bit about our services. This is what I can speak to the most. Um, every grazing outfit is a little bit different, but we're roughly all the same in the way our processes work. Um, but for us, we supply all the infrastructure needed to graze. We supply the livestock needed to graze. Um, we also supply personnel to watch the herd or the flock and to move the herd and the flock, as well as all the fencing that comes with it. And then finally, wildfire prevention. 
Um, so essentially we've set up our business so that we can take care of everything for our clients um, from start to finish. So there's nothing that they really need to do other than kind of sit back, relax, and watch the animals graze in their landscape. Um, and so, yeah, there's a variety of ways contract grazers can set this up just for us. Um, it works for us best to kind of take care of everything and let the homeowner enjoy um, watching that grazing process. So to start, um, I'm going to start with infrastructure. So to be a contract grazer, there is actually so much infrastructure that goes into making this business happen. I really wish it was as simple as opening the gate and letting um, the goats and the sheep thrive in their environment, but there is a lot that goes into it, which also goes into that cost um, and the reason why contract grazers do charge for their services. So the infrastructure includes, but is not limited to the livestock, electric fencing, solar panel chargers, water troughs, water trailers, trucks, stock trailers, um, self-contained travel trailers. For us, um, that is what our herders stay in while they are overseeing the project and overseeing the animals. Um, utility trailers, these trailers can haul loading panels, ATVs, any miscellaneous items that we may need to get to and out of a job site. Um, then we have signs. We have a variety of different signs with our company. The most common one you'll see is our caution of electric fence sign that's posted nearly every 25 feet on our electric fence. Um, but other signs that you may see in the public would be goat grazing ahead, sheep grazing ahead, um, goat herding ahead, uh, beware of livestock guardian dog in the area, and then general information signs that have our name on it, our contact information on it, and some general information about grazing and their practices, and just some reminders to keep pets on leashes. Um, and then finally, we have employees and herders. Our herders are paid a salary. Um, and then we have insurance. Insurance is a very, very big one. Um, I would always recommend to try to find grazers that have insurance if possible. That way, if something were to get out or something were to happen, um, your grazers do have insurance to cover that. Um, other things that are not mentioned here but are very notable are um, biannual vaccinations for livestock, dewormings for livestock, maybe nutritional feed and supplements. Our livestock do have their own nutritionist um, that works with us so they can get the optimum nutrition needed at any time. Um, and then things like fuel. So those are some other things that aren't listed. So grazing is a great business. We love it. We have a lot of fun, uh, but there is a lot that goes into it behind the scenes that make it all happen. Um, next, I'm gonna talk a little bit about electric fencing and equipment. It can be a little bit different from grazer to grazer, but generally we all use the same type of equipment. So for us, we provide all that equipment that's necessary to complete the project. Um, the only thing that we ask for from our clients is access to water. And as long as we have access to water, we can usually get water to the animals either by means of hoses. So we can attach hoses if it's close. Um, and if that access point is a little further away, it's usually not an issue. Basically what we'll do is we'll provide our herder with a quad or an ATV with a water tank and a water trailer, and they can fill up that tank from the access point and haul it to the animals. Um, and then we also have a larger 500 gallon water tank that we can put next to the animals as well. So there's a lot of different options as long as we have access to water. Um, if for whatever reason you may not have access to water, that's totally fine. We do charge an additional fee for hauling in water that just covers the cost of the water and the fuel. Um, but every grazer is a little bit different. So if you're going to hire a contract grazer, I definitely have a conversation about water and access points and whether or not they need to haul them in. That's very important. We want to have uh, or make sure our livestock do have access to water at all times. Um, to move on to the electric fencing side of it, for our company, we do use an electric netting operated by a solar panel charger. So it 100% operates on itself. I don't need to plug into anything. Um, this method helps keep our animals grazing in specific areas, and it also helps ensure more easy, even graze the land, making sure each job is complete to its original specifications. And the way we can do that is by fostering that rotational grazing system. 
So let's say you have 15 acres. By using this electric fencing, I can maybe section off an acre at a time and move from paddock to paddock, kind of leapfrogging it. And this really helps us as grazers make sure the vegetation that's left is what you as a client want. Um, and it fosters that rotational grazing system. It also, to an extent that electric fencing does help keep some predators out, um, but in the case that it doesn't, we do employ, I like to say employ, but they love their jobs. Um, we do send out our livestock guardian dogs to protect our herd and our flock from predators if they, um, if there's a significant risk. And then because grazing is more popular and you see it in all the parks, any chance I get, I try to remind people that if you see this fencing, it is electric. Um, so just try to keep your pets on leashes. If you see someone um, and they may not have read the sign, try to say a friendly, hey, watch out for the fence, it's electric. Um, we see it often, um, but yeah, just a reminder, keep those pets on leashes and try to stay away from electric fence. It pulsates, so it's not a current electric, or at least ours pulsates, so it's not a constant stream of electricity, um, but if you do hold your hand on it long enough, it'll pulse and it'll it'll hit you. It's not very fun. It's not going to damage you, but it's not fun. Um, so just a reminder, to try to stay away from the electric fence and keep those pets on leashes. Um, a little bit about our livestock. So for us, we use boar and Spanish goats primarily. We do have some Kiko goats in there as well. And then we also use Dorper sheep to clear vegetation and brush. Um, the great thing about Dorper sheep that you may or may not know is they actually shed their wool. Um, so you might see that, especially in the summertime, they shed off their wool in some chunks. And it's really great for us as grazers because we don't have to worry about shearing them. So it's really unique to the Dorper breed. Um, I think it's super cool, but if you see them shedding their wool, they're totally okay. Uh, they're just doing their natural process. And then um, a side note on that, depending on your project, we'll either use goats or sheep or maybe even a combination of both. Um, and we'll get into why that is a little bit later on. And then again, we may use those livestock guardian dogs, uh, those Great Pyrenees dogs, if needed to protect our herds from predators. So the difference between goats and sheep, they're super, super similar, um, but they do have some key differences. And the main one being that goats are browsers, um, which are typically used to target vegetation such as leaves, vines, shrubs, and those heavy brush projects with dense vegetation. Um, goats are also used for projects uh, like where there's a lot of trees or brushes or shrubs that need to be limbed up, up to six feet off the ground. They like to get on their hind legs and reach for everything they can. Um, we as grazers like to start all new projects with goats, especially if there's a lot of underbrush. Uh, they just do a phenomenal job of clearing out that underbrush and really uh, bringing back the ability for some of those native grasses to grow back. As grazers, especially with the brushed area, we see it takes about three years um, to get on track to restoring that land to its natural state. And then from there, um, we can use sheep, um, actually, because sheep are uh, grazers, meaning they prefer those grasslands and they're better suited to clear vegetation that's more grass-based. Um, we've even been on projects where a combination of both is super successful. Uh, it really just comes down to the land and, uh, just assessing that land and figuring out a game plan for the best way to manage it. So now I'm gonna get into the grazing process. Um, so there's seven key things that may go on for you if you're a homeowner or a business looking to grace. And I tried to give general information um, all of us contract grazers are a little bit different, but these seven things should be roughly the same. So the first one, um, we ask that you brainstorm your goals and have some information ready to discuss. Um, and on the next slide, I'll get into what do goals look like? What information should I have ready? Because um, these, these are the types of questions we'll be asking you. Um, my second process or my second in line would be to review UC's extensions match.grace or your own research to find contract grazers. So there's a couple different ways you can go about finding contract grazer. If you really don't know where to start, UC extensions match.grace um, can be a good landing point for you and you can uh, get matched up with different grazers. I know Dr. Stephanie Larson talked about that last month. Um, you can get matched up with different grazers and it can be a great place to start. 
Uh, the third step would be to reach out to grazers you may believe are a good fit for your property and discuss your goals with them. And that leads us into step number four. If possible, I would invite your contract grazer out to assess your land prior to animals arriving and signing a contract. Um, I would do this for a couple of different reasons. I would do this so that you can get to know the person that you're going to be working with. Um, you're going to be working with them, so you obviously want to be comfortable with them. You want to be confident in them. And um, really, as a contract grazer, I would also like to get to know who I'm working with. And then being able to make a plan for your land is always so much easier when we can see it firsthand versus on like Google Maps or something like that. There's a great advantage to being able to seeing it live and in person for us. And then when you find a contract grazer, that'd be step number five. I would try to sign um, a contract and book your grazing times. Um, I do want to let you guys know that sometimes grazers won't write you into their schedule without a signed contract. Uh, and some grazers might ask for a deposit prior to animals arriving. Everyone's set up a little bit different in the way that they schedule. And so it's important to have those conversations with the contract grazer you choose. Um, number six. Or before I get into set number six, another um, note on booking your grazing time. Um, every year it gets earlier and earlier. For example, if you wish to graze in May and June, our company um, already booked out May and June of 2025 last month. Um, if you want to graze earlier in the spring, we have spots. If you want to graze later in the fall, we have spots. Um, but if you are thinking about contract grazing, the earlier the better to reach out to some of these contract grazers. We do get booked, especially in those prime summer months. Um, so if you're thinking about it, it doesn't hurt to give us a call. Our company does free estimates all the time, so we're more than happy to come out. Um, with free of charge and assess your land and talk about your goals and um, trying to fit you into our schedule if it's something that uh, that works out. And then um, after that, like I said, you want to schedule or as your schedule time approaches, your contract raiser should uh, contact you with the day and time of their arrival. I do always say expect a little bit of grace um, within a day or two for your contracted day and time. Um, and this comes out for a couple different reasons. If you schedule with me in August and you schedule us, let's say for May 13th, depending on the weather patterns over winter, um, we could be a couple days off. Just that being, if we get a very dry year, I might go through my other contracts very fast because there wasn't a lot of grass growth. Where if we get a really wet winter, like we have last couple of years, that grass is going to be, or that vegetation is going to be thicker, denser, and longer. So it's gonna take me probably a couple more days to get some of the projects before I get to you. So we as contract grazers, at least our company, will keep you in the loop about where we are and um, what we can do. But um, you're a contract grazer and you should be having those conversations prior to animal arrival, just so you know what's going on and you're in the loop. And then finally, um, number seven, animals will arrive and complete the job. And so the process for that typically looks like um, animals arriving on, with, on a truck and trailer, and then as well as all their equipment. So basically what will happen is contract raisers will set up a pen. It could be the same day. It could be the day before. Set up a pen for the animals to be unloaded in. Typically this pen is also where you would like them to be grazed. Sometimes it's not just depending on logistics and how we can run them to your job, but they'll be un offloaded onto this pen. They'll start working right away um, from there the employee or the herder will get everything set to go for the remainder of your graze. And then if you're like us, where you um, have a self-contained travel trailer for that herder to stay in, we'll start working, getting that set, it up, set up on the property and really just get all everything set to go um, for the remainder of the couple of days, the weeks that they'll be there. And then the loadout is very similar, but just in reverse. So we'll start um, with the travel trailer, we'll get that out and then we will um, load the animals onto the trailer and then we'll go pick up that residual fence and then we'll load everything out. So it's designed to load in and out and leave nothing behind other than less vegetation. Um, and so that's kind of how that process works. And so when we go back to uh, step number one, brainstorming your goals and having the information ready to discuss. Uh, these are some of the things that I'm talking about. So we have uh, what do you want to accomplish through your targeted grazing services? As a targeted grazer, knowing my client's goals is most important to me because I want to make sure they're happy at the end of the day. 
So um, before contracting or contacting a grazer, you might think about what you want done on your property. Is your goal to have fire breaks? Is it purely to manage vegetation? Is it carbon sequestration? Um, those are the things that are really important for me to know as a contract grazer so that I can meet your goals and your specifications. Um, the next one is location. So what is the location of the property needing to be grazed? Um, is it just a small section on your house? Is it a large section on your property? Um, and that leads us into acreage. So what's the size of your property and how many acres are you interested in grazing? For me, both of those things are very important to know. Um, and that being the size of your property and the amount of acres that you're interested in grazing. And the reason both of these numbers are so important to me is because knowing this, I might be able to provide you with a more cost of select or cost effective solution based on our price scale. So oftentimes adding additional acreage can lower the cost per acre of a particular project. And so let's say you have 15 acres that you'd like grazed, but you were only interested in having a one acre fire break, but it might actually be more cost, of, cost effective and cheaper for you to graze five acres rather than that one, just because of the way that price scale works. Um, I also do want to note on acreage that, um, Maybe you're a community that has smaller parcels. Let's say all of you, for example, there's 20 of you that have one acre parcels. If one of you were to graze, the cost is going to be much higher than if you were all to get together and say, we want to graze actually all 20 acres back to back to back in this community. And if we do that, then we can offer a lower price per acre. We can offer like a 20 acre, or 20, 20 acre price per acre as opposed to one. And um, so those community grazing collaboratives are really, really cool. Um, they allow it, allow the cost to be cheaper for everyone. Um, typically with those co-ops, there is one person in the community that's in charge of getting everyone together. And then um, I've also seen it where people like Stephanie Larson come in and they really help the homeowners kind of come together and figure out their goals and what they would like to be done as a targeted grazing perspective. So if you are a very ambitious homeowner and you wanna take that on yourself, as far as a grazing co-op goes, that's great. Um, we work with people like that all the time, or maybe you're a group of homeowners that might need a little extra help. Um, that's when I would definitely suggest you reach out to people like Stephanie Larson that know, um, know contract grazing in and out and know how to help uh, community members come together and get that sort of thing done. And um, so those are all just really beneficial steps. Another couple of questions you might consider or things that I might ask as a, a contract grazer is access to property. Um, so this is a really big one. I need to be able to get into your property with a truck or a trailer. Um, and if I can't access your property, it's gonna be really hard for me to get animals. And if you don't know, that's totally fine. Um, we as contract grazers, we can Google map it and kind of tell you if we can get trucks and trailers through there. Um, or again, I'm more than happy to come out for your costs and let you know what I think, if I can get animals in there, if I can get trucks and trailers in there um, or not. So if you're ever in doubt, feel free just to call us up and um, just ask us if we think that that's something we'll be able to do. Again, access to water. We touched on this one a little bit. Predator issues. I do always ask if you know of predators in areas, please, please, please let us know. Um, we love our stock and we want to make sure they're protected. And so if you know it's a high predator area, we would prefer to put our livestock guardian dogs out uh, just to give them an extra bit of protection so we know that they're safe. Um, what time of year do you wish to have grazing services completed? That's another one to think about. Again, if you're not sure, we are more than happy um, to come out and tell you what we can do or what we would recommend based on our um, almost 10 years of doing this. And then one thing I would always um, encourage you to ask is what will happen if livestock escape their designated area when they're on my property? Um, and that leads us in, can a herder stay on our property? So for our company, uh, we won't operate without a herder on site. And that has a lot to do with the possibility of livestock escaping. Um, I don't want to say they'll never escape because at the end of the day, at the end of the day, they are live animals and that's always a risk associated with the business. Um, and that's why for us, it's really, really important that we have a herder on site 
because if something were to happen, they're there right away. Whereas if a herder wasn't on site, we may be 30 minutes to an hour away and they can do, um, they can get into a lot more stuff in an hour than they can if someone was there um, on site. And so for us, if you have vegetation that you really, really don't want eaten, we can take some preventative me measures. We may be able to fence around some things in case they might get out um, and stuff like that. But please always operate under the assumption that this is a risk. Um, your contract grazer definitely doesn't want them to get out as much as you. Our goal is to keep them in, but that is always, it's always going to be a risk um, with livestock. It just is. And again, that leads us into, a, can a herder stay on the property? Um, some contract grazers will operate without a herder on site and then some will not. Um, and so that's something that you should think about as a property owner is, are you comfortable with the herder staying on property? If not, your options might be a little more limited because you're going to have to find a contract grazer that is comfortable with that. And then if you are, um, I would start thinking about places we can put that uh, confined or self-contained travel trailer um, to park while the herders are overseeing that project. And then finally, the last segment, what should I expect from the grazing process? And this has to do with time management and costs. So the length of time to clear vegetation on each job is different. On average, it takes about 250 goats or sheep to clear one acre of land every one to two days. However, this estimated time will vary depending on the time of year, uh, the type of vegetation, the density of vegetation. And that goes back to, especially our winters, if we get a lot of rain versus if it's a dry year, that's gonna determine how much our uh, vegetation grows in the spring. And that will ultimately decide how long it takes to get through each job. Um, but again, for a more accurate and detailed estimate length of time, I would always recommend that um, property owners reach out to contract grazers and have those discussions and have a site visit. And then for cost, um, cost can be a little bit all over the map, just depending on grazers and their specifications. Um, so the gross, cost of a grazing project will vary by the amount of acres being grazed on the property. But typically as a whole, um, in the contract grazing world, the more acreage that's being grazed, the lower the cost is per homeowner. So um, some contractors, like I said before, will let neighbors partner together on a contract to increase the total acreage and then lower the cost for everyone. Um, but I would always make it like, I would always make it a point to know that if you're, if your contract grazer invoices through all inclusive pricing or by itemized pricing, and that's kind of the last key difference. So all inclusive pricing will include everything like mobilization, transportation, livestock equipment, everything that's needed to manage that project. Um, and when you see all inclusive pricing, it's typically done by, um, a price per acre. So it's a set fee per acre. And the other invoicing you might see is itemized pricing. So these are grazers that choose to itemize their pricing and they might have several different ways. You might see that on an invoice. So it can be um, typical to have an additional cost for transportation on top of the quoted, quoted price per acre. And then the last thing that you may see in the contract grazing world is that um, some contract grazers price per acre like ourselves, and then some may also charge by the animal per day. So depending on who you're getting your quote from, it can look a little bit different, um, but usually it all ends up to being around the same price. It just looks a little bit different when you get that invoice. And I think that's all I have for you guys on the contract grazing perspective. Um, for fire prevention. So I'll open it up for any questions. Right. Yeah, we do have some questions in the uh, that came in the chat, and then I also have a few questions. So um, let's see. There we go. Let me stop the screen share. Uh, actually, no. I'll let you go ahead and can you stop your screen share, Emma, for us? Very much. So sorry, I'm trying to get to the page. Oh, I know. It's hard to find sometimes <laughs> after. Um, you know, I, I could probably do it. Uh, let me do this. Um, and then I'll stop here. There we, there we go. Got it. Perfect. <laughs> okay. Um, okay, so 
uh, we have a couple questions from folks. And, um, oh, a couple just came in. Okay, so I'll hit those in a minute. Um, well, let me address a handful of questions that I kind of uh, came up with uh, in the time you were talking, and then I'll add to, to that. Um, so clearly it's not as simple as tying a goat to a stake and letting it eat in a circle and then moving the stake around. I wish it was. Yeah. <laughs> um, but is that a possibility for small lots? Because, you know, there, there are some smaller parcels that I can imagine could benefit from a little grazing, but at the same time, you know, you, you probably don't want to put a whole herd on there or is that something that um, it's just too kooky? Um, no, I'd say there's a market for everyone. Um, so we do a lot more large scale projects, but there are some grazers, the smaller herds that will come in, do smaller projects that might be a little more cost effective than what we can do it just because we are focused on those larger projects. Um, some homeowners do choose to get their own goats, but if you do go that route, I would just like to remind you that it's it's 24 seven and you will have to feed them once they've eaten all the vegetation. We do get some home calls of people trying to rehome their goats after it's done. Um, so if you do go that route, you wanna buy your own goats, that's great, that's awesome. I love getting more people into agriculture, but just keep in mind that when the vegetation goes away, they do require some maintenance and some food, but on the flip side, yes, there's definitely a smaller niche market um, for some smaller contract grazers um, to do. I, small yeah, I think Stephanie Larson, when she spoke last month, she mentioned something like that to the effect of, you know, uh, the cost that you're charged per acre also subsidizes some of the cost of the off season, you know, mm -hmm. care and handling of the of the livestock. Uh, so with that said, what's the smallest and largest areas or parcel size that, that you guys can handle? So we'll do, we're kind of in a unique situation. We'll do anything. Um, just because we will do anything doesn't mean it's necessarily the most cost effective. So we, we will do under an acre, but I can't promise you that it would be more cost effective than um, maybe a mechanical method. Um, because we are geared towards those larger projects and those larger projects and you get three to 300 acres might be, that's where you will see the most bang for your buck probably. Um, but we will come out for under an acre, so we'll do anything. Um, and do you guys have just goats and sheep or do you guys do other and livestock? Uh, we primarily specialize in goats and sheep. Okay. Yeah. I, those I imagine are the, the best eaters or whatever consumers of wildfire vegetation potential material they do really a good job yeah yeah and are those the most popular um, it depends on your project as Stephanie Larson likes to say it depends on what your goals are and I think yeah. that's really true there's some vegetations or some landscapes that are much better suited for cattle and there's some that are really well suited for sheep and goats so it kind of just goes back to individual landscapes and yeah. uh how to assess those and what we feel is best. Yeah, I, I learned, yeah, I learned so much that this is so much more complicated than I ever imagined it, even in terms of the, the slope of the terrain, the type of terrain, is it, you know, easily walkable for the animals or are they, are the animals or livestock big and heavy? Are they going to tear up the, the soil, et cetera, et cetera? Yeah, there's a um, lot that goes into it. And then, you know, they all have different diet needs. And, and with that said, a question came in the chat. Um, um, you know, are, are there species of animals that particularly enjoy French broom? Because we do have a lot of that all over the county that's the broom terribly is, invasive. I know. The broom is difficult. Um, like scotch broom and stuff like that. We can try to eat it when it's younger, about an inch or so, and it can't be wider than maybe the width of your pinky. But once it's full out and grown, I I can't get them to eat it. I, I don't know of anybody that can. If they can, that's awesome. Let me know your secrets. But with that broom, it's just, it's really hard. It's really thick. Um, As far as eating it, it, there's not a lot of success with that. Maybe a little Tabasco sauce. <laughs> 
Hey, um, is there, do you have, I know it's going to be all over the map, but can you give us, you talked a little bit about the, you know, what's involved in the costing it out per acre, et cetera, but is there kind of like just a really broad guess rule of thumb cost per acre um, yeah. or like an average of between this much and that much? Because that could be helpful for us if we're looking at a project and trying to, you know, imagine getting grant funding to do something. It is hard um, to give you an average because it just depends on a lot of different things. Um, I could give you our whole cost breakdown. Um, and I'm more than happy to give anyone our whole cost breakdown. Uh, other grazers, and it, this is where it gets tricky because there's some grazers that won't do, a pro they have like a $10,000 minimum and some grazers will do something for, you know, $1,000 if there's so many acres. And so it's really hard to give a rough estimate um, just because everyone's pricing system is so different. Um, but for us, um, anything two acres or less would be like 6,900 just because we're geared towards bigger projects yeah. where you get to that um, three to 300 acre range, then I would say the average um, within that scope, again, there's sections that are different, right? It's all tiered out. So it's not a three to 300 price bracket, but the average between that is about $1,500 an acre, if that makes sense. So is that 6,900 for the smaller parcels per acre or per two acres everything's per acre okay so that's yeah. not terrible i think right now the average cost of hand work is between four and six thousand dollars per acre you know again depending that's um, why um we always bring up that idea of co-ops right if you have seven yeah. in a row that can get you to that three acres it brings the price significantly down for everyone involved and so yeah if you do live in a community like that, it's a really, it can be a really great tool to all get together and graze together. Yeah. In terms of economy of scale, it almost feels like if you compare those two numbers, if they are accurate, um, it, it gets to a point where grazing could be a lot more economical than hand crews because the hand crew cost breaker is not really going to change much by increasing the number of acres it's just it just takes as much time and this many people to do a period uh whereas if you have you know 100 acres that you're putting a, a herd on that can be done probably quite a bit cheaper than hand crews Get, yes. although you know given the limited height that <laughs> the animals can reach and, and do you have giraffes <laughs> um Let's see. Uh, there's another question that came in the chat um, about that. Oh, grants that cover grazing. Um, yeah, Chris, we have experienced, my experience with grants and grazing currently is that Cal Fire, for whatever reason, isn't real keen on covering the cost of grazing in grant funded projects if you're seeking money from Cal Fire or the California Climate Initiatives. Um, however, I'm pretty sure that Goldridge RCD and maybe even perhaps the Sonoma RCD have leveraged their ability to get funding and I think recently have offered some opportunities to, to cover the cost of grazing. Yes, we've worked with both of them previously. And then um, I do know Stephanie Larson has um, other suggestions and she's helped people with grant funding in the past before. So that'd be another great resource if you're looking into it. Yeah, perfect. Um, okay, we have time for a couple more questions if nobody wants to toss any in the chat. Uh, oh wait, RCDs have funding available uh, through the, okay, Land Smart Grazing Bro. I thought there was something. Yeah, so Sophia put in the chat that there's this thing called Landsmark Grazing Program and the website's in there. So take a look at that, Chris, or anybody else who's interested. Um, any, if anybody else had any questions at this point, we have a small enough group, just go ahead and raise your hand and then uh, turn off your um, audio and video. And we'll, there we go, Chris has more questions. <laughs> okay, go ahead, Chris, uh, go ahead and turn off your video and audio. Uh, actually, actually, I um, 
I was just thanking the Land Smart Grazing Program. You know, it really, really is a problem if we can't get the French broom addressed. Incidentally, it's supposed to be called French broom instead of Scotch broom now. Sorry, yeah, that was my error. Yeah. So, I mean, what can we do about broom? Is there no animal like llamas, maybe? <laughs> eat broom. <laughs> it's, we re literally have this year an explosion of acres of broom, particularly bad this year. So anyway, that's my gripe. Yeah, we're we're <laughs> fire safe summer. We're, we're we have worked and hope to continue working with Jason Mills from Ecological Solutions, and he is passionate about eradicating broom, and he's got some pretty good ideas. I think I'm not the expert, but uh, my intuition tells me he's got some really good ideas in terms of how to manage it properly and in an environmentally correct way uh, to the point where over time, and it does take time, like years, to fully eradicate uh, an area of, of broom, um, but it, it's insidious. And I don't think it's from, I think it's somebody, I think it came from a different country and you know now it's an invasive here in California. Um, Okay, anybody else have any other questions? We have like three minutes. If we go a couple minutes over, that's okay because we like to package these up and make them a full hour. <laughs> All right, well, that's fine. Um, we have a question in the chat, Roberta. We do. Oh, how um, did you learn? Yeah, Emma, how did you learn about grazing? Do you have educational recommendations for uh, learning this practice? Um, yeah, so grazing, my husband's family friends um, run Star Creek Land Stewardess, great grazing company as well. Um, so we knew about the business, and we kind of learned a lot from them. Um, we were just fortunate to have friends in the business that helped us through this process. Uh, right now, I don't have any educational, as far as like college or universities majoring in this, I don't have any recommendations. I think that's partly because grazing at least at this scale, like contract raising is so new. Um, but there is a lot of people in the industry. Um, I'm more than happy to help anybody. My husband, Chase, is more than happy to help anybody. And then I know I probably sound like a broken record at this point, but I would reach out to Dr. Stephanie Larson. She's amazing. She understands grazing. Um, you know, she has her PhD in rangeland. She is a wealth of knowledge um, and a great resource. Um, here's an off the wall thought I just <laughs> So if anybody is really interested in learning more about this, can they connect with you directly and maybe do like a field trip and a, like a one-on-one, -on -one, um, you know, sure. um, walk and we're, talk? We're, yeah, we're more than happy to do that. Um, actually, Stephanie Larson has put on several grazing workshops um, in the last couple of years that we've been a part of. And she also invites other grazers out. So you'll get kind of everyone's different perspective in this business. And I'd really recommend that as well. Um, she may have one in the works already. I don't know. I'd have to reach out to her, but she has done that in the past and we've all gotten together and had roundtable discussions and demonstrations. And so um, if the need and the want is out there, um, I, we would all be more than happy to do another workshop like that. Yeah, and that's what inspired us to do this two-parter because I um, watched Stephanie's presentation a few months ago um, and I, I thought, wow, this this we need to share this with more people. So let's get this on our program. So um, great. All right. Well, thank you, Emma, for your presentation. Uh, now it's going to be here forever on our channel. <laughs> Thank you so much for having me. Totally, totally. And uh, I'm sure while we didn't have a huge audience right this moment, um, I'm sure that within the next few weeks, our views of this are going to go through the roof. <laughs> um, and thank you, Marika and Emily, for helping out today. I, if I had to do this by myself, it would be even less crazy than it looks already. Um, or kooky, whatever. So anyway, thank you. And thank you guys all for attending. Appreciate it. Uh, and we hope to see you next month. Uh, next month, don't forget, we're going to have Fortress on to talk about their uh, unique and, and environmentally safe 
uh, chemical fire retardant treatment stuff um, should be pretty interesting. We get to learn some some chemistry, I think, next month. So again, thanks, Emma. Thank you guys for joining us today. And Marika and Emily, thank you. And thank you to our uh, new fellows for hanging in there and seeing uh, our program. All right. Bye, you guys. Bye.